Good morning, everyone, wherever you are. God bless you. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day that God has made. And it's so good to come together and worship together. And it's like we are meeting in one place. Even though we are just meeting online, but it's just like we are face, we are meeting you face to face. So let's worship the Lord. Let's embrace His love today because we know He's a great God. He is a mighty God. He's, he's so good that sometimes you can't find the right word to say who He is or all the things that He has done for us. Such a beautiful God that we have. A God that has loved us with an everlasting love. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just commit this time. Come into His presence. Just come into His presence. He's just waiting. Wherever you are, in your living room, in your office, or wherever, even if you're driving, just know that He's just holding you with you. Father God, I just thank you for this day that you have made, Father God. It is such a beautiful day, Father. As I watch this live stream, Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will come to speak to us today. You will come and embrace us today. I just need your love a lot today more, more than before, Father God. Thank you, Father God, that you have loved us with an everlasting love, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Your love cannot be comprehended, Father God. We love each other because, God, you have poured that love into us, God. We love each other because you have poured that love. Thank you, Father. Whatever goes, whatever taken away, but I know that your love is the only one remains, Father God. Your love remains to the end of our life. Thank you, Father. That love is enough. Your love is enough that I know and I know that you will come after me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Let's worship the Lord. Let's worship wherever you are. Our God is greater. That's our first song today.
Father God, let we know and we know, Father God, that when you are with us, when you are with us, nothing can ever stop us, Father God. When you are God with us, who can stand against Malaysia, Father God? Thank you, Father. Let's do the declaration as we are here, knowing and knowing that we serve the great God. Let's read our declaration. We declare that the presence of the righteous in our land protects it from disasters, plagues and poverty. We declare that our prayers for our national leaders are bringing peace, safety and radical conversions to our land. We declare that radical conversions are happening all across our nation with people forsaking sin, coming to Jesus, getting water baptized and becoming powerful leaders in Malaysia. We declare that the kingdom of God is advancing in Malaysia and that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Yes, yes, because He is a great God. The God who can do anything, a great God who can do miracles, God who is putting His hand over Malaysia. Thank you, Father God, for great thing that's happening in Malaysia. Thank you, Father. Just one thing. Just one thing, Father God. And that's your love. Thank you for your love.
does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. Yes, Lord. Your love never fails, O oh Father God. Your love that just being poured out to us, O oh Father God. And you are God who fought for us, Lord. You are a God who come looking after us. You came for us. You came after us. Even when we were wondering, but God, you came after us. You break all the obstacles. You break all the barriers. You break everything that's stopping us from coming to you. You just want us to be with you without any hindrance. And you have done it all for us. You light up everything for us, looking after us, coming after us. Thank you, Father God. That's his beautiful love. It doesn't matter what we have done, but he's done everything just because he loves us.
just know that he's taking care of everything for you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. There is no mountain that's big for him. There's no any great mountain greater for him. He can just climb it up. He can just kick it out. He can just remove it. He can just remove it. There is no sickness that he can't heal. There is no disease that he cannot heal. There is no problem that he cannot solve. There is no burden that he cannot lift up. And there is no chain that he can't break. There is no curse that he can't break. There is no generation curses that he can't cut off. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that can stop us to achieve what we want in our life because we have victorious God. Thank you, Father. If you have anything today, just, just say this bridge one more time. Let's sing this bridge again one more time. Saying that God, there is no shadow that you won't light up. When I'm in the darkness, you're going to light it up, Lord. And there's no mountain that you won't climb up. Come up, Lord. Come. Because you are coming after me. I know that, Lord. And there's no wall that you won't kick down. You're going to kick the wall that I can see right now, God. You're going to kick it down. And there is no lie. I'm not going to believe on any lie because you have already teared down all the lies. And you are God who's coming after me. You're a God who's coming after me. You're a God who's coming after me. Thank you for the reckless love, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Let's prophesy. Let's say this. No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me. No wall you will kick down. Lie you will tear down. Coming after me. No shadow you won't light up. Mountains you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. Now you won't tear down. Coming after me. No shadow. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, 
you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Thank you, Father God, for this beautiful love. Not, we are not far away. We are in Him. We are with Him. He's always with us. As we go into the time of communion, Jesus often used metaphors uh, to describe himself as, for example, I'm the true wine, I'm the way. Similarly, he used metaphorical language when he took the bread and the cup. He described it as his body and his blood. Before we look at the divine exchange, just want to say, when we say every word from this divine exchange, it is not just reciting it. It it should not just look like a ritual, but we know and we know knowing that every word that comes out of our mouth is life. If we say that means we mean it. When we say we are healed, that means we are healed. When we say we are set free, means we are set free. Let's read the divine declaration full of faith, knowing that He has done it. And every word that we speak gives life. Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. Jesus was wounded that we might be healed. Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. Jesus tasted death for us that we might share his life. Jesus endured our poverty that we might share his abundance. Jesus bore our shame that we might share his glory. Jesus endured our rejection that we might have his acceptance with the Father. Jesus was made a curse that we might receive the blessings. Jesus was cut off that we might be joined to the Lord. Our old man was put to death in him that the new man might come to life in us. Thank you, Father. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's party the bread and the cup. through touch and go e-wallet you can bank into a CIMB account until we meet again in church just pray thank you Father God for every offering thank you Father God for every hand that bless this funds Father God Father I pray for your wisdom for us to use this funds and thank you Father for extending your hand over this funds, Father God, and continue to be channeled wisely for the work of your kingdom. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
A husband and a wife uh, having a disagreement and they stop talking to each other for a while. They were giving each other the silent treatment. I'm sure some of us couples here would understand what, we're, what I'm talking about. Maybe even in some relationships at work, you know, with our friends, with one another. So they were giving each other a silent treatment. And uh, one day the husband was supposed to travel to another city for work. The next morning, he had to suppose to catch a flight at 7 a.m. in the morning and he had to wake up at 5 a.m. And he needed somebody's help to wake up, obviously his wife. But he was too proud <laughs> to ask his wife for help. And he didn't want to break this silent treatment. So what he did was he uh, went ahead and uh, uh, wrote a piece on a piece of note, flight at 7 a.m., wake me up at 5 a.m you know, rather arrogantly because, you know, he don't want to let down his guard. And he wrote it on this post-it and he posted it on a piece, you know, on the, on the side of a bed, maybe on a, on the reading light or on the clock or somewhere that she could see it. And he went to sleep very happily, rather smugly, thinking that, ha, huh, I have won. The next morning he woke up at uh, 8 a.m., and realized, lo and behold, I have missed my flight. And he was pretty upset. But then suddenly he saw another piece of note stuck to the side of his clock. So he took that piece of note and he read there and he says, it's 5 a.m. Wake up! Exclamation mark. So uh, obviously he didn't win the argument. Our topic of our theme or that we are going through now is the fourth S, which is submission. And uh, the story has nothing to do with what we're going to be looking at today. But even before that, why don't we commit this time to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you that your word contains everything that we need. The key to everything that we need, especially, Lord, when it comes to relationships. Holy Spirit, we thank you for speaking to us today and helping us, Lord, to be able to navigate through all the relationships that you've brought into our way, as we have seen in the last few weeks, Lord, relationships are a key, Father, to our relationship with you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fall afresh upon our hearts and speak ever so gently to each and every one of us that we may hear your voice and be able to respond to it, especially to your word as you speak to us today. We commit ourselves into your hands. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 11. And if you have your Bibles with you, it'll be good for you to turn to that portion of Scripture, although I will try to share it from time to time. And there are times that I may not share, so you know it's good for us to open our Bibles so that we know exactly where the Bible says what. Because this is going to be really important, brothers and sisters, for each and every one of us. So let's jump straight to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. And we heard this last week. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now, if we had, Paul had stopped in verse 1, if we have any encouragement from being united with Christ, comfort in his love, you know, we would have, would have been pretty happy. He's speaking about everything that we already have in Christ Jesus. You know, it's like, God has provided us an identity. God has poured out his love into our hearts. 
And we are looking at the vertical aspect of our relationship with God. But God does not just want us to have that vertical aspect of our relationship with Him, although that is really important, but God desires us to be complete in our relationships. And our, our completion in our relationship comes through our relationship even with one another. And there will, there will be nothing that makes the heart of our Father complete in joy because this is something that He cannot control. There's nothing that would complete His joy except by when His children come together by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, many times we look at this portion of scripture and we think to ourselves that we all have to be all in agreement with one another. And we all have to go in a certain direction. We all have to, you know, and normally more so than the other, one person decides and everybody else has to agree to that. Even though we have our own opinion, we are not entitled to speak up our opinion. In church, everybody has to follow the opinion of the pastor. At work, everybody has to follow the opinion of the boss or the employee, sometimes the influential employee or the parents or the children. And we think that it's the outcome that God is talking about. And we all know that it is impossible for us to all agree on the same thing at the same time. Now, God knows that we have a free will. In fact, God encourages free will. God encourages diversity. Can you imagine the whole world being filled with Pastor Sam's? You know, we, we are happy and thank God there's only one Pastor Sam. You know, or, or one Mahade, or one, you know, there's just that one person. And everybody thinks like that and everybody is flowing with that. Now, obviously, that is not what God means. You know, he loves diversity. He loves the uniqueness, the unique way that he has made you and that he has made me. You know, you think in a certain way, I think in a certain way, and God really treasures that he, he designed us that way. You know, to even, can you imagine, even our fingerprints are different. Our iris pattern is different. God has de designed us in diversity because that's who God is. God is a creative God. He's a creative father. You know, no two children are the same. You know, I have two children and both of them are different from each other, different personality, different likings, different way they think, different approach to life. They are entirely different. And even in a family, husband and wife, we are different. And, and parents and children, even within the family, sometimes we cannot make a decision, one common decision, you know, and sometimes there's a lot of tension, like where are we going to eat? You know, what do we want to buy? What color do we like? You know, and uh, what program do we want to watch on TV? Everyone has their own taste. And you know what? That's fine. And this is not what Paul and the Holy Spirit is speaking about in verse 2. Then make my joy complete by like-minded. Everybody say, okay, I'll agree. I all, we all watch this channel. Or everybody agree. Everybody must agree. Otherwise, you are walking in rebellion. You know, you must do this. You must do that. You know, God really doesn't, you know, that, that's not the heart of God. What God desires is that we express our own heart and our desire. But what does he mean then when he says, obviously it doesn't mean the outcome, the decisions that we make. But there's something else on a much higher plane, on a much higher level. Make my joy complete. Like a father saying to his children, you know, stop being in, in, in moving in this array, moving in, this, uh, this, uh, in, in all kinds of directions and doing all kinds of things. But make my joy complete like a father by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one in spirit and of one mind. So how do we even do that? And what does that even mean? The Bible doesn't leave us without any clue and tells us what that ex exactly means. What would make the heart of the father, you know, having a joy that is complete. You, we as parents, you know, we, we know our joy is complete. You know, we have provided everything for our family. We have provided everything for our children. Our joy would be complete if they got along with each other. I know, and their relationships were even though they are diverse and come from different backgrounds and different tastes, but we are walking in a certain kind of harmony that would really glorify the family, glorify the kingdom of God, glorify our Father in heaven. So what exactly does it mean by being like-minded, having the same love and having one spirit? 
So it's, it's, it's found in the following verses, verses three and four, where it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's the first thing. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, if you really take a moment here, God is really telling us to take a step back, not focus on the outcomes. The outcomes is chakwitiao or nasi kanda. That's the outcome. You know, everybody having diverse opinions. It's not about red color or blue color. It's not about watching football or watching the soap opera on TV. It's not about that. God is saying that even before we come to making those decisions because he loves the diversity. He loves the, the collaboration and the discussion and the, you know, uh, you know, talking about stuff and coming to a common understanding. But he said, before you even do that, take one step back and ask yourself these three things. Number one, are we doing it out of selfish ambition and vain conceit? Do we value one another rather in humility, value others above ourselves, not looking to our own interests, but each of us to the interests of others? If we look at the world, the world is based on these things. It's about selfish ambition and vain conceit. I want to push my opinion. And if you disagree with my opinion, I am going to say you are not like-minded. And you are flowing with a different kind of love. You're flowing with a different spirit. You know, how many times I've heard these things being said? Sometimes even in church, flowing with a different spirit because you are not flowing with my ideas, my choices of song, my vision, my goal, where I want to go. Whether it's a pastor or whether it's the church member. You know, this, is, this goes both ways. It's top, bottom, as well as bottom up. It's... It's collaboration with one another. How do we come to a point where we are of the same mind, where we have the same love, sharing in the same spirit, one spirit and having the mind of Christ, having the like-mindedness that is in God. It is by stepping back and asking ourselves this question before we even do this collaboration. Are we doing it out of selfish ambition or vain conceit? Do we in humility value others above ourselves, not looking to our own interests, but to the interests of others. We have a worship team in our church. Simple example. One of the things that the worship leaders do is before they send out their playlist to the rest of the worship team, to the musicians and the singers, they will send it to me. And we have this understanding. We're talking about this understanding here where we will sit down and we will collaborate with one another. We will talk to one another about the list of songs. Does it flow with the theme of the church? Is, it, is, it, is, there, is there a message that is being spoken through these songs? Is there something that we would like the church members to receive um, as a message from this song? Is the choices of songs? And sometimes there is, you know, we, 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 we will discuss and maybe the, the worship leader has a certain choice of song. I have a certain choice of song. This happens in every family. And you know what? It's not about if I want them to follow my choice or I have to follow their choice of songs. But we step one step backward and we look at these principles and we say, are we doing it out of selfish ambition and vain conceit? I want to push my agenda. I want to push my goal. You know, vain conceit means is this trying, one version of Bible, the NLT says this, is trying to make an impression of others, trying to claim credit for ourselves. Now, the Bible tells us don't do it out of that. Not, don't do it for self-credit or self-exaltation or because I have a certain agenda. Even though the other person has a point, I'm going to push my agenda through. God says, take one step back. For to have the joy in the Father that is complete, this is what he means. This is what he means by having the same mind. That means we play by the same rules. Can you imagine husband and wife? Can you imagine parents and children? Both ways, because we are called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Having these values or these ground rules set before us, this is what he means. We may have differing values, we may have differing opinions, and it's great, according to the Father. The problem is, 
we operate on the first level, the lowest level. And sometimes we can even get offended and say that I, I want it this way and you want this way. And because you're the boss or because you're the parent, because you're the father, I have to obey to you. Otherwise, you're going to use Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 on me. You're not like-minded. You're not of the same spirit. And that's, that's painful. You know, sometimes when we hear that in a team or in a family, words like that used. But God says, even before we do that, enjoy the, the difference, the diversity, the, the, the celebrate the diversity, but make sure we come back to this point. Even while we are collaborating, this is our, this is our DNA. This is the DNA of the kingdom of God. This is the mindset. This is the template that we are using. We're not doing anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The worship leaders and I, we have this collaboration and we understand each other and we can work through. And then we find what is best for the whole church. And we come out with this and, and in, no, in no way uh, humiliating each other because I want my values to be put in, but valuing each other. The value that we have in a teammate, the value that we have in a brother or sister, the value that we have in a child, far exceeds my opinion about anything else. Whatever it is, I'm going to make sure that they understand their value. Not looking at our own interests, but also the interests of others. Not looking for my interests or their interests, but the interests of the whole church. You know, if you look at the secular world, many of them started, have started to get this. You know, one, one example is the insurance industry. In many years ago, when the insurance agent approached us to sell us insurance, they will ask us this question. I want to come and talk to you about insurance or buying insurance. And these two words are sometimes very scary. And sometimes we put them off and we say, we don't want to talk or we have no time or we trace, you know, call me back later and things like that. But somewhere along the way, the insurance industry learned a very important principle. And instead of selling insurance or asking us to buy insurance, they told us that, would you be interested in a life investment plan? I had a very close friend who was selling insurance. Because in the end, it is insurance anyway. But when he used those words, it was not about him making money out of me, but it was him trying to help me save for the long term, save for my lifetime, life investment plan. And you know what? Immediately I said, I'm interested. I want to know why. Why? Because the focus is no longer us but is to value the other person. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The principle here is this. It's not trying to push our ambition or vain conceit, but to see how we can serve one another. In humility, valuing others above ourselves, you first, and not looking to our own interests, but each of us, every one of us applies to the same ground rules. Now, friends, as I said here, it applies top, bottom, management to workers, workers to management as well. Because as the workers and employees, as children in a household, as the wife in a household, we also, all of us, look out for the interests of each other. Does the decision that we make work out for the interests of all of us here? Or is it just one party is going to gain the victory, so to say? No, the outcome might be the same. We might still get the result if we work by manipulation and abuse and all those things. But the outcome is not something that, is, that was rich with the heart of God inside of it. You know, that is so important for teams. You know, even when we go out for mission trips, even when we do uh, a ministry together, it's important for us to recognize the media team and the worship team working together. They, they understand these ground rules. We do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The management and the employees of a company working together in every aspect, students in, in, and teachers in the school, we are doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. It's not about my agenda. It's not about the agenda. We all have this understanding in humility, valuing others better than ourselves and not looking to our own interests, but each of us, every one of us understands this ground rule. Can you imagine if every one of us had this mindset? How different a relationship would be? Can, can we just picture a relationship? Can we just picture a couple, a family having these principles? It doesn't matter what we are discussing about, but the ground rules are this. We do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Go out for Orang Asli trip. 
We are doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. We serve our community. We are doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, we are valuing the people that we are serving. We are valuing the people who are serving, valuing us in humility above themselves, not looking to their own interests, but each of us looking for the interests of others. Now, this is really speaks about a team. Now, the church is a team. In fact, even better still, the church is a family. Then it will not be about issues anymore, friends. It will not be, it's, sorry, it will not be about personal. It's not, it's nothing personal. You know, if you really want to look at this in this way, it's no one claiming credit and it's nothing personal when we discuss about something. You know, for example, you know, if it says that your mic is too loud and we want to adjust your mic, it's nothing personal. It's just an example. You know, there's too much salt in the curry. It's nothing personal. You know, we, sometimes we can take it personal. I know it happens in every household. You know, you, you have come late. You don't spend enough time with the children. It's nothing personal. We do it. We can have the same outcome by taking a step back and saying that, am I saying it? out of selfish ambition and vain conceit? Am I in humility valuing others above myself? Is this the understanding in our family? Is this our, is this our understanding in a ministry, in a team that is working together? Because these are what we call kingdom principles. And these kingdom principles apply to every situation and every circumstance of our life. And, you know, going on to the next uh, scripture, you know, Paul summarizes these two verses with one beautiful verse. What does this mean? What do we do to make the joy of the Father complete in our relationships with one another? He's saying simply this. Verse 3 and verse 4 speaks about the mindset of Christ. He says, in your relationship with one another, husband and wife, parents and children, employer, employee, teacher, student, in every relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What's the mindset of Christ Jesus? Go back one slide and you see the mindset of Christ Jesus. Jesus did nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He was not trying to impress anyone. In fact, he left the glories of heaven to come to the earth. He left his position at the right hand of the throne of God. And today he's back there again, but he left and he came in the form of a man and he humbled himself. He says, this, this is really the mindset. And, 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 the, and the Bible says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Now, why? what is this mindset? The mindset of in humility, valuing others above ourselves. Isn't that what Jesus came to do? He valued others above himself. He looked out for the interests of others rather than of his own interests. He looked out not for his own interests, but for the interests of others. This is what we call the mindset of Christ. And, he's, and this is how Paul summarizes verse 3 and verse 4. It's as simple as this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Not everybody agreeing on the same thing. Not everybody have to go in a certain direction, but taking one step back and saying that this is what it means to be like-minded. It doesn't mean all making one same decision. This is what it means when you step back and you say, I'm going to value you. I'm, this is both of us, all of us are going to have this, this value, this mindset in, in, in humility, valuing each other above ourselves. You know, and in the humility, uh, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, not, not trying to impress others. This is the mindset of Christ, of Christ Jesus, that we are to have with one another. It's truly a picture of service because we're moving from submission to service. And he says, when we have the right pattern of godly submission, we will have the right pattern of godly servanthood. If we don't have the right pattern of godly submission, then we will get a wrong pattern of godly servanthood. We will think servanthood means I have to agree with everything. With someone in authority has spoken. And often we use these scriptures 
to drive those principles and say that, you know, drive that point and say that you need to work with me. Otherwise, you need to obey, you need to follow my decision. And it doesn't give any room for collaboration. It doesn't give any room for discussion. And we make things personal. You know, when certain decisions are made, it is made as if it is a personal attack. But God wants us to move one step back and ask ourselves this question, whether it's uh, someone serving or someone being served. The question is this, are we doing it in humility, valuing each other, not doing out of selfish ambition and, and vain conceit and valuing each other above ourselves? And what is the mindset of Christ? In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And this is what it says. Who being in the very, this is the mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being in human likeness and being found appear in, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, isn't this a picture of submission? But even more, isn't this a picture of humility? If you really look at this, at the core of submission, friends, is humility. At the core of godly submission. Godly submission is all about, not all about devaluing each other. It's not all about taking the upper hand, is asserting control or, or getting our own way. Either way, husband or wife, all right? Because we are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The husband, sometimes the head of the household, but the wife sometimes has got ideas and thoughts. And sometimes the whole idea becomes, you need to, sub you need to submit to me. But it's submitting to one another. Even employee and employees. Do you know that employees have a lot of control as well? They can make life difficult for their employers. They can make life a, a, a living hell sometimes for their employees and those that they are working under. So it works for both ways. It doesn't just work one way or the other way. But God is saying that this is the nature. Being the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now, if you look at this scripture, these three verses, it's very interesting. It talks about Jesus humbling and humbling and humbling himself. There are three levels of humility. Number one is he humbled himself from God to man. And the second level is he humbled himself from man to being a lowly carpenter. He could have been born in a palace as a prince, as a king, but he became a lowly carpenter. And then the third level of humility is that he gave his life as a ransom for many. He took upon himself the punishment for all our sins, for all our disease, all our sicknesses. He took upon himself the, and, and he died on the cross for each and every one of us. You know, Jesus became humble and humble and humble. And you notice that, you know, it is through this humility that he showed his submission. Submission in the eyes of the heavenly father is not just about having control and those who are controlled by but at the core of godly submission is humility. And it doesn't mean that when he humbled himself, he lost everything. You know, we have to understand that many times, as we said it earlier, it doesn't mean that he didn't agree. In fact, many times we have noticed that Jesus disagreed with the Pharisees. Jesus disagreed with the teachers of the law. And he spoke up and he voiced up, sometimes even expressed his, his uh, displeasure at things that are going on around him. But it doesn't mean that he was not submitted to the Father. Now, very easy for us to know. We just have to go back to the principles that we saw earlier in verse 3 and verse 4. You know, when we do something, are we doing it out of selfish ambition and vain conceit, trying to claim credit, make an impression? Jesus passed that test. He was not doing it out of selfish ambition. In fact, you saw here that he left all sense of entitlement in heaven when he left the glories of heaven and he came down to earth and he died upon the cross for each and every one of us. You know, Jesus didn't, didn't try to, didn't devalue anyone above himself. He valued, in humility, he valued others above himself. Now, some of us may say, well, pastor, Jesus had some really harsh words 
against the Pharisees. Jesus called them sometimes, even called them out, you know, and, and even use strong language. You brood of vipers, you whitewash tombs. But you have to understand this. You know, he was working in, he was influencing mankind, influencing others through a heart of a son. By he chose to influence them through service. Now, this is where we go from submission to service. He chose to influence them through his heart of service because they were there trying to lord over the people, trying to manipulate and control the people and trying to bring the people into submission using the values that they understood. And this is sometimes can even happen in any relationship, in church, to families, to work, in every realm it can happen. We try to control by manipulation, by abuse, by using a strong arm. But Jesus showed us another way in that sense that even though he had the authority, even though he was entitled as the son of God, he left the glory of heaven. Being in the very nature of God, if you have your Bibles in verse 6, it says, being in the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Isn't that what the Pharisees were trying to do? They were trying to use their position for their own advantage. But Jesus was calling them out and saying that, <clears throat> I'm not going to agree to this. But because this is not godly submission. Jesus was teaching us submission through his own life, through his own example. And he says that I choose to influence through humble service. Now, how many times we, we try to influence through control? But he's saying that the key to submission is choosing to influence, whether I influence my husband or whether I influence my children or whether I influence my wife or my employer or my employees, is I choose to influence through humble service or customer, whoever, through humble service in Christ's likeness. Now, like, again, I want to say it doesn't mean that we don't call out the truth and speak out the truth. When, when things are not being done in the right way, we call it out. But it is done in humility, value the other person. It's not done out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That is our check. Uh, that is our filter. That is our check and balance. We move one step back. And considering the interests of others, even above ourselves. Are we you know, it's, it's an example. It's like, like our children. Sometimes they do things that we know that is going to lead to something that is not pleasant. And sometimes we have to speak out and we have to tell them, say, look, this is not going in the right direction, especially when they're much younger. And in fact, all throughout their, their lives, in fact, our, our level of influence, the way we influence them changes from mentor, from, from parents, you know, disciplinarian, they grow up and then we become mentors and we become their friends. We come alongside them. We choose to influence them. We choose. It's a choice. And, and the important thing is that are we doing it for ourselves or are we doing it for them? Now, that's the key. Are we valuing them? Are we looking out for their interests? And many times parents, you understand. Teachers, you understand. Students, you understand. When, when we have to speak out, we have to speak out. And sometimes when we don't understand, yes, of course we submit and we say, Lord, we don't understand and we just simply submit. But the key thing is this, whatever we do, the filter always goes back to this, valuing others better than ourselves. It's not about us. It's about the whole, everyone, all for the good of all. We serve God for the good of all. It's not about my reputation, you know, like, oh, you're shaming me. You should not have done that. You should not do, do this. You know, you know how much of shame you brought to me, we tell our children, you know, sometimes when we correct them, that is manipulation. But we influence them. We choose to influence them through humble service by speaking up and telling them, look, you know, this is not good for you. Because somewhere down the road, if you keep on with this same pattern of behavior, we can tell our employees, we can tell our students, we can tell even our teachers if they are moving in completely the wrong direction. But we better be sure. Because sometimes if you are not sure, just humbly submit to them. Because you choose to influence them through humble submission, humble service. 
and, and the, the, the filters are all there. You know, this is something that will really make the heart and the, the heart of the father, his joy to be complete. You know, rather he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant. It doesn't matter for him to take on the nature of a servant because his whole motive and idea is to submit to human authority as unto God. And as we said, you know, well, he was not so nice to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, but we have to understand this. In the end, what happened? He died for them on the cross. And he said on the cross this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They did it out of ignorance. They did it because they did not. Now, with my humble service unto them, unto God on the cross, he was wanting to influence them. And many of them were influenced. Nicodemus was influenced. Joseph Arimathea were influenced. And many, many Pharisees were influenced. Many of them eventually, even Paul, who was the Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, Paul was more than all the other Pharisees put together. He never read about him being a Pharisee. We read a little bit. He went around persecuting the church and dragging them from house to house and, and bringing them to, you know, to be, to be punished. And yet, through the humble service of Christ, he saw what submission was really all about. And he began to take on this heart, not out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, in humility, valuing others above ourselves and looking out for the interests of one another. This is what it means, friends, to be like-minded. This is what it means to be of the same love. If we make decisions, that's later. As we say in Bahasa Malaysia, belakang kira. We'll look at that. But the most important is, are we having this principle? You know, once we have this mindset, once we have this template, you know, every conversation and every relationship, it doesn't matter when there is a disagreement. It doesn't matter if we don't see eye to eye. Because in the end, what we are doing is, it's not out of selfish ambition. It's not out of vain conceit. But it is humility, valuing others above ourselves. It's looking out, not just for our interests, but also not looking out for our own interests, but for the interests of those who are around us. This is the picture. He humbled himself in appearance as a man and he, by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And, uh, you know, let's look at the result of that. When Jesus humbled himself, because humility is the core of godly submission, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We win by humbling ourselves. By through that humble service which came through humble submission, he obtained the name that is above every other name. Friends, if we follow this principle in every aspect of our lives, what will begin to happen is that we will see ourselves, we will see whatever the, the influence that we want to have over others will increase. You know, it's, it is said that the husband is the head of the house, but the wife is the neck there is still the influence that she can bring to a family. The, the employees can influence their employers through humble service. The employer can win their employees through choosing, by choosing to serve one another in humble service. And I tell you, friends, when we do that, who is glorified? God is glorified. His, his name is lifted high in every relationship. Not only is his name lifted high, we get what we want. In the outcome is that it's not by just our opinion. We get what we come is that our joy is complete. Our joy is complete. Isn't that what we want? Everything, you know, we have this overcoming joy. We, we have received the anointing of God. We receive the will of God. We see the power of God manifested. Can you imagine a church that walks in this kind of humble submission? Submission that is 
that plays out, that is manifested as humble service. Can you see what happens to that church? God is exalted to the highest place and, and, his, and his name is lifted up. When people begin to see a community that walks in this kind of submission, godly submission, that in the name of Jesus, friends, this, this scripture is not apart from the scriptures that are before it. It's when the body of Christ walks in this kind of godly submission to one another. Not just, you know, how many relationships have broken up? How many people have walked away from each other, even walked away from church, resigned, left the company, good people? Why? It's because sometimes this, these principles, you know, we, we have not operated in the principles that God has given us. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. People will begin to see there is a difference here. You know, there's a saying that goes this way. I think John Maxwell is the one who came up with this. He says, people don't care how much we know until they see or feel how much we care. Who is the one that the wife will value the most? Who is the one the employee will value the most or the employer will value the most? Is it the one who tries to push their way through and bludgeon their way through or walks in rebellion and walks in manipulation and, and in abuse? The one that is remembered is the one who cared for them. In humility, serve them, chose to serve them and not to manipulate them. Who is the teacher that you remember the most in your life? Who is the parent that you, know, you, are, you, you are drawn towards? Who is the leader that you are drawn towards? Is it one who tries to manipulate you or tries to abuse you or tries to put you down and doesn't value you? Or do you work towards someone who values you? and looks out for your interests above their own interests. You see, you win, I win, God wins. Everybody wins when we submit to one another in the, in the, in the love of God, in the, Christ, in the love of Christ. Mm. Now we're going to look at just three simple things mm. and we're going to end. True submission in the kingdom is never about using our authority to control and manipulate others. True submission in the kingdom. True submission in the kingdom of God. This is, there's a false submission. There's a worldly submission. But submission in the kingdom is never about using our authority to control and to manipulate others. Secondly, it is choosing not to control and undermine others, but instead to serve the best interests of others in love. It's not to control or undermine others, but to serve the best interests of others in love. And finally, in this, Christ is glorified. And in this is our great reward in him. Isn't this a, pic isn't this a picture of Christ himself? True submission in the kingdom is never about using his authority to control and manipulate others. Now, if we can walk in this Godly submission. Friends, I tell you, we would have relationships that are so Christ-like, so rewarding, so much of peace, and ultimately so much of joy. Complete my joy. How can we complete the joy of the Father? It's never about using our authority to control and manipulate others. Isn't that what we have seen sometimes? It's, not, it's choosing not to control and undermine others. It's nothing personal. We don't get personal. But instead, we serve the best interests of others in love. And sometimes, it might even involve confronting them with the truth because we are serving the best interests of others. In this, ultimately, Christ is glorified and this is our great reward. Friends, I want to ask us a question. Do we see submission as a way of keeping order in the family, church, and society, or as a demonstration of God's unconditional love at work in me? Look at the picture of Christ. What did he do? He chose to serve in humility. He chose to influence by serving through human, in humility. He didn't see as a way of keeping order in the family. That's not what it's about. And if we have learned it in that way, it's time for us to unlearn it. 
Now, it's a good question for us to ask ourselves, maybe in a small group when we are sitting down and discussing, how do we see godly submission? Is it a way of keeping order in a family, in a team, in a ministry, in a corporation? Or is it a demonstration of God's unconditional love at work in me? It, this one works both ways, all right? And ultimately, let's make a declaration. Let's declare this together. I have the mind of Christ, Jesus, and therefore pour out my life in total obedience to God in humble service towards others. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for this time. We thank you, Father God, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to come together to learn about godly submission and how godly submission transitions into service. Lord, our service that comes out of godly submission to one another is incredible service. It's a service that glorifies you. It's a service that is so focused and centered on you, whether it's in the worship team, we serve because we're not serving men, because we're serving you. In our working place, we understand that we're not serving you, but we're serving, we're not serving men, but we are serving you. In our family, we're serving you and not just serving the will and the demands of control in the family. But it's a demonstration. All our service slot is a demonstration of God's unconditional love working in our lives. Lord, begin to continue to draw us to this kind of godly submission. Help us to understand what godly submission is all about and live out this godly submission in every realm of our life because this is the key to every relationship. It's a key to everything, Lord, to see breakthroughs, Father God, where Christ is exalted, where Christ is glorified, where Christ is manifested, whether it's in church, whether it's in our working place, whether it's in our family, in every realm of our life, in school, Lord, this is the key to everything that you have given us. This is the key that completes your joy. And Lord, when you joy, there is celebration, there is breakthroughs, there is great things that happen. This is the key to greater things. We thank you, Father, for showing us these keys, Lord, through your word. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, friends, and we will see you soon. Amen.